This is my demo for lab one, part one. We have our crawler on the floor. Sorry, our Tesla Model S on the floor. Uh, some obstacles around. And I have my terminal SSH'd in. We're gonna run our test script for obstacle avoidance. The script is pretty simple. It just keeps driving until it sees an obstacle. Once it sees an obstacle, it'll stop, back up a little bit, and then turn, choose a different direction and turn that way. Let's see if it'll detect me. Got kind of close there, but you know, seems to be pretty functional. There you go. So this is the car that you just saw in the demo there. Um, so I know it's kind of hard to see on this webcam how everything is wired, but um, <clears throat> you can see that I have the camera module, which you know hasn't been used in the first part of the lab. I have it kind of rigged up here in the back. You can see the cable for that is sort of getting slipped in underneath so that it can connect to the actual Pi board underneath um, per the instructions. Um, I'm pretty happy with my cable management. I was able to keep the cables, you know, away from the sides of the car, which was initially a problem. I actually ended up taking apart like half of the car after I realized that my cable situation was just chaotic. Um, you can see that we have our power supply, which is just these two red and black cables running in, obviously it gets kind of lost in this little jumble, but it does come back out here um, where it connects to, you can see if maybe if I tug it, you can kind of see that it's tugging on that wire to our power supply. Um, we have the, the servo connector here, which as you can see the brown wire that goes to our ground, you know, red and yellow follow appropriately. As for the rest of these, um, like for the motors, I mean, it's really hard to show that the motors are going to the right place, obviously, because they have to go under the car, but you saw the car was moving forward and backwards correctly. So you can probably take my word for it that those cables were correctly attached. Um, you know, we have our uh, photo sensor and our, uh, and our speed sensor down here, our five pin and four pin respectively um, going underneath the car and Peeking up there in the middle, again, probably hard to see, but you can see that there are a couple of cables coming out here from the bottom, coming out through this middle slot, coming out on top where they're then connected, um, you know, up here, as you can see the five pin and then the four pin next to it. Uh, we have uh, the ultrasonic sensor, obviously, is attached up here. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the, all the different cables that are connected, all the different wiring, luckily, for this lab, we had all these little plastic slots, which made it so that you can't really plug these in backwards unless the actual components were, you know, wired incorrectly, which is a very real issue. I found that with this car, there, there were issues. My bottom plate wasn't cut correctly. And then my ultrasonic sensor was just completely broken from the start out. It kept detecting things that weren't there just from the very beginning. Um, and I actually suspect that my speed sensor isn't working. Um, it's constantly reading a speed of zero, no matter how fast I have the car going. So yeah, I think I probably have to get that replaced. I don't know how important it is for the lab. Uh, I haven't read ahead all of part two, so I don't know, but um, I'm probably going to want to replace that if it is necessary for the lab. But yeah, that's the, the basics of the wiring. Here is a quick demo of our self-driving car, trying to get from that corner of the room to this sandal, more or less. So we're gonna come to our SSH terminal. Gonna run the script. The reason it actually takes a second to pause after is because it's calculating the route as well as printing out some graphs to uh, 
to the system so that we can inspect them later, which is important for our report. So you can see it's turning as appropriately. It never moves too far uh, because it doesn't necessarily, the ultrasonic sensor range isn't that long, so it has, there you go. It has a dedicated amount. We can go over here and see that our script stopped. So it reached our. So because our object detection code is a little bit slow, um, and we couldn't get a great video of it uh, in our actual demonstration. I just wanted to show that the object detection code is working. It's just a little bit too slow for it to run in the demonstration. So if we go over here to Python 3, we're running mapping.py. It's going to start doing its normal scan. It thinks it's in the corner of the room. It's going to try to move around. You'll see it has initial position and it has not detected a person. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn this car around so it's facing me. And we're going to look back over here at the code. And now let's wait for it to update. Now it says person is true because the camera is facing me. You see? And so now it's actually going to wait for the pedestrian to move. So you see, because it's scanning and person is still true, it's waiting for a pedestrian. If I now turn the car around again so that there's no longer a pedestrian, the next time it scans, it should come back as false. And now it's going to continue doing its uh, it's thing just like how it was. So the code is working, it's just, you know, it's a little bit slow for actual demonstration. So this is the code explanation. Um, <clears throat> for part one, pretty much everything is contained in this driveround.py file. Remember, this is the one where it essentially behaves as like a Roomba. So uh, you can see we have a method drive around, and it's just saying, while well, we have not quit uh, the program, if we detected an obstacle, stop, wait, choose a random direction, and then back up until you no longer detect an obstacle, turn in that direction, and then delay again. Otherwise, it just keeps going forward. Um, and this is the Roomba behavior. Uh, the scan around protocol um, just wraps around the get distance at method, scanning at various intervals as the car is moving that's run on its own thread. And um, yeah, you can see this is very simple. In order to run obstacle avoidance, we just run these threads concurrently, one to scan, one to drive, and one to check to see if the users hit Q to quit the program. For part two, uh, the code is a little bit more complicated. Um, we have some constant values that are uh, kept here. These are used all over, you know, things like the size of the room, the size of the car, these angle measurements, right? Uh, various epsilons and uh, fuzz factors, you know, delays and things like that that we want to use. Um, <clears throat> we leverage the detect Pi camera TensorFlow code that we've pretty heavily updated it to try to make it a little bit faster um, to run for our purposes. Uh, I won't go too into this because, you know, I think everyone has seen this code. Um, just some adjustments. We used uh, NumPy to speed things up. And then in our actual mapping protocol, we used um, some threading to run the TensorFlow code. <clears throat> so uh, this is the more interesting part. So I have a, a utils file that I made. This has some simple like, you know, going forward, change, uh, you know, translating coordinates from polar to Cartesian coordinates, turning, things like that. Uh, Mapping.py is the real um, place where most of the code is. So you can see we basically, we have some global variables, the environment itself, the car's heading, its location, um, whether or not there's a stop sign detected and whether or not a pedestrian's detected. And uh, we initialize the car's position, we initialize the environment. Um, we have some methods to, for printing graphs. These are how we generate the graphs in our report. Um, we have methods to update the environment given um, sensor readings, right? So given the array of sensor readings with specific angles, we can update the environment. This is just a lot of math, pretty much. Updating the car's position in the environment, or at least uh, its belief state for its position. Um, checking if a coordinate is in bounds of the room. Um, this actually scans. This is what, when you see the car stopping and scanning, that's what the scan angles method is. Um, we have the ability to construct an adjacency matrix from our environment, particularly the downsized environment. So we have a method to shrink our environment so that it's small enough that we can construct a small enough adjacency matrix and then run a star on it to calculate paths. Uh, we use Bressenham's algorithm here to generate the set of line points between two points to detect if there's an obstacle between them. We get the points that are closest to it, and then we check to see if any of those have an obstacle. Um, there's various methods here to convert these uh, types of coordinates back and forth because, you know, that we have nodes versus downsized coordinates versus full-size coordinates, so just some conversion methods, some distance methods. 
um, some methods for turning, a method to go to the next coordinate. This is the one that's called pretty often to try to go to the next uh, coordinate according to the A star path, um, or at least as far as it can according to the ultrasonic sensor range. It's never going to go farther than the ultrasonic sensor's range to avoid um, bumping into something that was initially out of range. Um, we have our update detections based on if we're seeing a pedestrian or a stop sign, our run object detection method that's just constantly being pulled. Um, this is running on its own thread, as you can see right here. And yeah, you can see that basically the main loop is, the main code is to initialize the environment, our destination, and then um, while, our des while our distance to our destination is greater than some epsilon, uh, we scan the environment, we update the environment, um, we construct our downsize environment, construct our JC matrix, build a graph from that matrix, transform um, our current location coordinates to the corresponding node, um, and then compute the shortest path from our current location to our destination location using uh, A star. And then we pluck off the next node in the A star path to know where our coordinate is, translate it into its appropriate um, full size coordinate, and then go to the next coordinate in the map using our method above. And so that's the that's the code.